Hi everyone, and welcome to The Movement Image. Today, we're going to look at Jordan Peele's 2017 film, Get Out. More than just a horror film, with Get Out, Peele confronts the reality of America for black people, showing how deeply systemic white supremacy is ingrained in our society. When describing the film's portrayal of this reality, Lonre Bacare of The Guardian wrote, The villains here aren't southern rednecks or neo-Nazi skinheads, or the so-called alt-right. They're middle-class white liberals, the kind of people who read this website, the kind of people who shop at Trader Joe's, donate to the ACLU, and would have voted for Obama a third time if they could. The thing Get Out does so well is to show how, however unintentionally, these same people can make life so hard and uncomfortable for black people. It exposes a liberal ignorance and hubris that has been allowed to fester. It's an attitude, an arrogance which in the film leads to a horrific final solution but in reality leads to a complacency that is just as dangerous. By framing systemic white supremacy in this way, Get Out shows how the problem has been normalized in America. Peel's portrayal of this normalization parallels Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil. With the banality of evil, Arendt shows how cultural practices can lead to horrific forms of oppression. We're going to look at how Get Out echoes the banality of evil, but first, let's do a little background on the concept. Hannah Arendt introduced the concept of banality of evil in her 1963 book Eichmann in Jerusalem, which documented the trial of infamous Nazi murderer Adolf Eichmann, who organized the transportation of Jews across Europe to concentration camps. After World War II, Eichmann escaped Germany, disappeared, and quickly rose to the top of international most wanted lists. In 1960, Eichmann was found in Argentina and captured by Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency. He was then extradited back to Israel, where he was put on trial. This trial was a big deal, as Eichmann was the senior most Nazi still alive. Hannah Arendt covered it for the New Yorker, and as Arendt sat in on the proceedings, she was astonished to find that Eichmann wasn't the larger-than-life villain he'd been made out to be but frighteningly normal. A few quotes from the book help illustrate this point. I was struck by the manifest shallowness in Eichmann, which made it impossible to trace the uncontestable evil of his deeds to any deeper level of roots or motives. The deeds were monstrous, but the doer, at least the very effective one now on trial, was quite ordinary, commonplace, and neither demonic nor monstrous. Except for an extraordinary diligence in looking out for his personal advancement, he had no motives at all. He merely, to put the matter colloquially, never realized what he was doing. It was sheer thoughtlessness, something by no means identical with stupidity, that predisposed him to become one of the greatest criminals of that period. The trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him, and that the many were neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were, and still are, terribly and terrifyingly normal. From the viewpoint of our legal institutions and of our moral standards of judgment, this normality was much more terrifying than all the atrocities put together. It's important to unpack these quotes, because, in a certain light, banality of evil can look like an exoneration of Eichmann, which isn't what Arendt is trying to say. She firmly believes that Eichmann is responsible for his horrific actions and deserving of his punishment, but she also wants to draw attention to the fact that the problem is bigger than this simple, rule-abiding man. With the rise of capitalism and industrialized society since the 18th century, our world has become increasingly systematized. The systemization leads to a thoughtlessness towards our actions and their effects with thought mostly devoted to increasing efficiency or creating rules to alleviate future thinking. Under industrialized systemization, thinking has become commoditized, and if thoughts don't result in economic gain, they're generally not of interest to society. This systemization can lead to oppression that is both massive in scale and so pervasive that it covers its evils in a veil of ignorance. For Arendt, the rise of evil in Nazi Germany stemmed from this potentiality of systemization, which, as Arendt put it, turned evil into a social norm. Arendt's banality of evil occurs when a cultural practice becomes so ingrained that questioning it 
is more bizarre than carrying it out. As much as some may not want to hear it, in America we have a similar form of systematized oppression. And if you think it's ridiculous that I'm comparing the United States' white supremacy to Nazi Germany, then you might want to brush up on the past 400 years of American history. Even Hitler admired America's white supremacist bona fides, applauding our country for refusing full citizenship to non-whites and our willingness to slay millions of indigenous people. The America of Hitler's era may seem like a relic, but our country remains rooted in systemic white supremacy. Mob lynchings have given way to institutionalized forms of oppression. The United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world, and a 2018 Pew Research poll reported that black Americans represented 33% of the sentenced prison population, nearly triple their 12% share of the U.S. adult population. This example is a small drop in a large pond of systemic oppression against black people. Recently, the extrajudicial murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other black Americans by police have rekindled discussions on these institutionalized forms of oppression, drawing attention to how systemic white supremacy continues to do just as Arendt said, perpetrate evil as a social norm. Get Out takes these social norms in its sights, addressing their evil through the guise of a horror film. The film tells the story of Chris, who's visiting his girlfriend Rose's parents' house for the first time. Initially friendly and warm, the film slowly grows into a more troubling narrative. Through the use of common patterns of ignorance, Get Out shows us how systemic white supremacy is so ingrained in our culture, we often fail to notice it's there. What leads to the horrifying events in Get Out isn't anything out of the ordinary. The groundwork is instead laid through banal platitudes used by white moderates in conversations with black people. Comments like, I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. Best president in my lifetime, hands down. And, Gordon loves Tiger. Oh, the best I've ever seen, ever, hands down. Aren't played up for a horror film. They're common, ignorant ways that white people objectify black people. Jordan Peele discussed comments like these as an inspiration in interviews mentioning how often a black person's blackness is used as an icebreaker by white Americans. So like, in, well, in the party scene uh -huh. in Get Out, uh -huh. for example, there's, it's a scene where, uh, you know, it's a, it's a group, he, he's the only black guy. So it's a bunch of older white people who are trying to connect with him with, on, on his blackness first yes. yeah. and saying things like, you know, I, 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 I know Tiger, <laughs> I know Tiger, yeah. right? And that, that's a situation yeah. that, you know, so I, I've been in. Yeah. I think every minority has been yeah. in. It's, you know, uh, on the surface, it's, it's a harmless thing, but what I, I wanted to point out with this film is that it's connected to the, the, the real, the deep horror of racism. With Get Out, Peel breadcrumbs us through this objectification to make his broader point. Many of the comments made to Chris smack of the banality highlighted by Arendt. Platitudes, empty gestures, and racial stereotypes lay the groundwork in this movie for what's to come. And many would say what comes is ridiculous. A Frankenstein's lab of black mutilation in service to white elites. Problem is, the reality of America's systemic oppression is similarly frightening. This is touched on in an early scene that echoes the real world. When Chris and Rose hit a deer, a policeman shows up to document the accident. In a papers please moment, the policeman asks Chris for his identification even though Chris hadn't been driving and no crime has been committed. This is emblematic of America's banal approach to law enforcement. In the eyes of the law, a black man is assumed guilty until proven innocent. After this first example, the film continues to show how systemic white supremacy leads to the objectification of black people. Like previous examples have shown, White people project a lot of assumptions onto black people without actually getting to know them. For the first two-thirds of the film, this objectification can be written off as well-intentioned white people who are doing something that, if we're in a forgiving mood, is weird, but not very harmful. The thing to keep in mind is that we're talking about a horror film, but we haven't really seen anything conveyed as horror. It's exactly as Arendt said about Eichmann. 
These people are quite ordinary, commonplace, and through the first two thirds of the movie, neither demonic nor monstrous. The examples in the movie arouse our suspicion or make us uncomfortable, but it's not through a typical horror motif. By subverting our expectations of horror, Get Out constantly stokes the fires of suspense while putting up a sunny exterior. The film's locations aren't dark, frightening places, but bright and colorful. This drives home the fact that these people have nothing to hide. Their treatment of black people is despicable, but it's unquestioningly accepted by their peers. The film's lighting and color play a critical role in showing the power dynamic at work here. Even towards the film's conclusion, when Chris is trapped in the basement, it's not the setting we'd imagine for a horror movie. It's impeccably furnished and looks pretty comfy. Central to this is the fact that the room has a broad ceiling of lights that makes it oddly welcoming. Again, this speaks to the fact that this isn't a space that has anything to hide. Inherited from the generations that came before them, these people are just acting out systemic white supremacy through banal repetition. This warmth and security is contrasted by the portrayal of black characters who live at the Armitage household. Scenes with Georgina and Walter embrace darkness and are shot more candidly. The establishing shot of Georgina is a great example. In this shot, Georgina isn't where we'd expect such an important character to be. She's off to the side of some bright windows when we'd expect her to be introduced in front of them. This conveys a simple message. In this house, black people aren't supposed to soak up the limelight. The film then continues to give us glimpses of Georgina and Walter without context, like Georgina by the window or Walter running at night. Notably, the Armitage family is never shown in this way. When we combine the dark, candid setting of these scenes with the misplaced motives for Walter and Georgina, Peel shows us how easily the banality of evil can be invoked we've become suspicious of the wrong characters for no real reason. Speaking of suspicion, we are watching a horror movie where suspense needs to be built and the audience needs to be clued in on things. To accomplish this, Peel uses intense close-ups. Discussing the techniques used in the film, director of photography Toby Oliver said, when things were getting weirder, or some of the characters were behaving a bit strangely, like Georgina, I let the camera push in quite close to her face and used a wider lens than you would normally use on a close-up. In the scene Oliver is describing, Georgina is being perfectly kind as she apologizes for unplugging Chris's phone. A shallow depth of field and intense close-up are combined with the camera pedaling backwards, as though it's trying to scurry away. This makes us feel that behind her too kind exterior, there's something else at play in Georgina's actions. These intense close-ups create discomfort in otherwise welcoming settings, and drive home many of the dialogue cues. A lot of the time, Peel cuts to these close-ups to emphasize emotional responses that build our empathy with Chris. In these shots, the extra-wide framing plays up Chris's isolation letting us know that his discomfort is not shared with those around him. An example of this is when Chris meets Andre at a party midway through the movie. Initially, it looks pretty normal. They're outside, it's bright, and the framing is wide and welcoming. As Chris and Andre begin to chat, this changes. Chris recognizes something's off, and Peel switches to a close-up with a shallow depth of field to convey Chris's concern to us. It's a subtle effect, but it adds a psychological element to the scene, showing that Chris is so focused on Andre's bizarre behavior, the rest of the world is fizzled away. Perhaps the most disturbing thing about Get Out is that much of the narrative isn't very different from real life. While systemic white supremacy is used in Get Out to create a ridiculous scenario around objectifying and lobotomizing black people, in real life, the outcome is equally reprehensible. Extrajudicial murder and violent oppression. Get Out was eye-opening for a lot of white audiences, with many saying it made them aware of realities faced by black people in America. By coloring in these gradients of systemic white supremacy, Peel's film captures how these banal, inherited forms of oppression can lead to greater evils. 
So how do we improve this situation? It's in creating accountability in these lesser infractions that we make the more severe problems less common. With any hope, we'll someday look back on Get Out as an important message from a bygone era. The problems Peel confronts aren't going to be solved overnight, but we've got to start somewhere.